The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde Chapter 8 When his servant entered, he looked at him steadfastly, and wondered if he had thought of peering behind the screen. The man was quite impassive and waited for his orders. Dorian lit a cigarette and walked over to the glass and glanced into it. He could see the reflection of Victor's face perfectly. It was like a placid mask of servility. There was nothing to be afraid of there, yet he thought it best to be on his guard. Speaking very slowly, he told him to tell the housekeeper that he wanted to see her, and then to go to the frame-makers and ask him to send two of his men round at once. It seemed to him that, as the man left the room, he peered in the direction of the screen, or was that only his fancy? After a few moments, Mrs. Leaf, a dear old lady in a black silk dress with a photograph of the late Mr. Leaf framed in a large gold brooch at her neck, and an old-fashioned thread mittens on her wrinkled hands, bustled into the room. "'Well, Master Dorian,' she said, "'what can I do for you? I beg your pardon, sir.' Here came a courtesy. "'I shouldn't call you Master Dorian any more, but, Lord bless you, sir, I have known you since you were a baby. And many's the trick you've played on poor old Leaf. Not that you are not always a good boy, sir, but boys will be boys, Master Dorian, and jam is a temptation to the young, isn't it, sir?' He laughed. "'You must always call me Master Dorian, Leaf. I will be very angry with you if you don't. And I assure you I am quite as fond of jam now as I used to be. Only when I am asked out to tea I am never offered any. I want you to give me the key of the room at the top of the house. The old schoolroom, Master Dorian? Why, it's full of dust. I must get it arranged and put straight before you get into it. It is not fit for you to see, Master Dorian. It is not, indeed. I don't want it put straight, Leaf. I only want the key. Well, Master Dorian, you'll be covered with cobwebs if you goes into it. Why, it hasn't been opened for nearly five years, not since his lordship died. He winced at the mention of his dead uncle's name. He had hateful memories of him. That does not matter, Leaf, he replied. All I want is the key. And here is the key, Master Dorian, said the old lady, after going over the contents of a bunch with tremulously uncertain hands. Here is the key. I'll have it off the ring in a moment, but you, you don't think of living up there, Master Dorian, and you're so comfortable here. No, Leaf, I don't. I merely want to see the place, and perhaps store something in it. That's all. Thank you, Leaf. I hope your rheumatism is better. And mind you, send me up jam for breakfast. Mrs. Leaf shook her head. Them foreigners don't understand jam, Master Dorian. They calls it compot. But I'll bring it to you myself some morning, if you lets me. That will be very kind of you, Leaf, he answered, looking at the key, and having made him an elaborate courtesy, the old lady left the room, her face wreathed in smiles. She had a strong objection to the French valet. It was a poor thing, she felt, for anyone to be born a foreigner. As the door closed, Dorian put the key in his pocket, and looked round the room. His eye fell on a large purple satin coverlet heavily embroidered with gold, a splendid piece of late seventeenth-century Venetian work that his uncle had found in a convent near Bologna. Yes, that would serve to wrap the dreadful thing in. It had perhaps served often as a pall for the dead. Now it was to hide something that had a corruption of its own, worse than the corruption of death itself. Something that would breed horrors, and yet would never die. What the worm was to the corpse, his sins would be to the painted image on the canvas. They would mar its beauty and eat away its grace. They would defile it and make it shameful. And yet the thing would still live on. It would always be alive. He shuddered, and for a moment he regretted that he had not told Basil the true reason why he had wished to hide the picture away. Basil would have helped him to resist Lord Henry's influence and the still more poisonous influences that came from his own temperament. The love that he bore him, for it was really love, had something noble and intellectual in it. It was not that merely physical admiration of beauty that is born of the senses and that dies when the senses tire. 
It was such a love as Michelangelo had known, and Montaigne, and Winkleman, and Shakespeare himself. Yes, Basil could have saved him, but it was too late now. The past could always be annihilated. Regret, denial, or forgetfulness could do that. But the future was inevitable. There were passions in him that would find their terrible outlet. Dreams that would make the shadow of their evil real. He took up from the couch the great purple and gold texture that covered it, and, holding it in his hands, passed behind the screen. Was the face on the canvas viler than before? It seemed to him that it was unchanged, and yet his loathing of it was intensified. Gold hair, blue eyes, and rose-red lips, they all were there. It was simply the expression that had altered. That was horrible in its cruelty. Compared to what he saw in it of censure or rebuke, how shallow Basil's reproaches about Sybil Vane had been, how shallow, and of what little account, his own soul was looking out at him from the canvas and calling him to judgment. A look of pain came across him, and he flung the rich pall over the picture. As he did so, a knock came to the door. He passed out as his servant entered. "'The persons are here, monsieur.' He felt that the man must be got rid of at once. He must not be allowed to know where the picture was being taken to. There was something sly about him, and he had thoughtful, treacherous eyes. Sitting down at the writing-table, he scribbled a note to Lord Henry, asking him to send round something to read, and reminding him that they were to meet at 8.15 that evening. "'Wait for an answer,' he said, handing it to him, "'and show the men in here.' In two or three minutes there was another knock, and Mr. Ashton himself, the celebrated frame-maker of South Audley Street, came in with a somewhat rough-looking young assistant. Mr. Ashton was a florid, red-whiskered little man, whose admiration for art was considerably tempered by the inveterate impecuniosity of most of the artists who dealt with him. As a rule, he never left his shop. He waited for people to come to him, but he always made an exception in favour of Dorian Gray. There was something about Dorian that charmed everybody. It was a pleasure even to see him. "'What can I do for you, Mr. Gray?' he said, rubbing his fat, freckled hands. "'I thought I would do myself the honour of coming round in person. I have just got a beauty of a frame, sir, picked it up at a sale, old Florentine.' "'Came from Fontill, I believe. "'Admirably suited for a religious picture, Mr. Gray. "'I'm sorry you have given yourself the trouble of coming round, Mr. Ashton. "'I will certainly drop in and look at the frame, "'though I don't go in much for religious art. "'But today I only want a picture carried to the top of the house for me. "'It is rather heavy, so I thought I would ask you to lend me a couple of your men.' "'No trouble at all, Mr. Gray. "'I am delighted to be of any service to you.' "'Which is the work of art, sir?' "'This,' replied Dorian, moving the screen back. "'Can you move it, covering it all, just as it is? "'I don't want it to get scratched going upstairs.' "'There will be no difficulty, sir,' said the genial frame-maker, "'beginning, with the aid of his assistant, "'to unhook the picture from the long brass chain by which it was suspended. "'And now, where shall we carry it to, Mr. Gray?' "'I will show you the way, Mr. Ashton, if you will kindly follow me. "'Or perhaps you'd better go in front. "'I am afraid it is right at the top of the house. "'You will go up by the front staircase, as it is wider.' "'He held the door open for them, "'and they passed out into the hall and began the ascent. "'The elaborate character of the frame "'has made the picture extremely bulky. "'And now and then, in spite of the obsequious protests of Mr. Ashton, "'who had a true tradesman's dislike of seeing a gentleman do anything useful, "'Dorian put his hand to it so as to help them. "'Something of a load to carry, sir,' gasped the little man when they reached the top landing, "'and he wiped his shiny forehead. "'A terrible load to carry,' murmured Dorian, as he unlocked the door that opened into the room, that was to keep for him the curious secret of his life, and hide his soul from the eyes of men. He had not entered the place for more than four years, not, indeed, since he had used it first as a playroom when he was a child, and then as a study 
when he grew somewhat older. It was a large, well-proportioned room, which had been specially built by the last Lord Sherard, for the use of the little nephew whom, being himself childless, and perhaps for other reasons, he had always hated and desired to keep at a distance. It did not appear to Dorian to have much changed. There was the huge Italian casson, with its fantastically painted panels and its tarnished gilt mouldings, in which he had so often hidden himself as a boy. There was a satinwood bookcase filled with his dogged school books. On the wall behind it was hanging the same ragged Flemish tapestry, where a faded king and queen were playing chess in a garden, while a company of hawkers rode by carrying hooded birds on their gauntleted wrists. How well he recalled it all! Every moment of his lonely childhood came back to him as he looked round. He remembered the stainless purity of his boyish life, and it seemed horrible to him that it was here that the fatal portrait was to be hidden away. How little he had thought, in those dead days, of all that was in store for him. But there was no other place in the house so secure from prying eyes as this. He had the key, and no one else could enter it. Beneath its purple pall, the face painted on the canvas could grow bestial, sodden, and unclean. What did it matter? No one could see it. He himself would not see it. Why should he watch the hideous corruption of his soul? He kept his youth. That was enough. And besides, might not his nature grow finer after all? There was no reason that the future should be so full of shame. Some love might come across his life and purify him and shield him from those sins that seemed to be already stirring in spirit and in flesh, those curious unpictured sins whose very mystery lent them their subtlety and their charm. Perhaps, some day, the cruel look would have passed away from the scarlet, sensitive mouth, and he might show to the world Basil Hallward's masterpiece. No, that was impossible. The thing upon the canvas was growing old, hour by hour and week by week. Even if it escaped the hideousness of sin, the hideousness of age was in store for it. The cheeks would become hollow or flaccid, yellow crow's feet would creep round the fading eyes and make them horrible, the hair would lose its brightness, the mouth would gape, droop, would be foolish or gross as the mouths of old men are. There would be the wrinkled throat, the cold, blue-veined hands, the twisted body that he remembered in the uncle who had been so stern to him in his boyhood. The picture had to be concealed. There was no help for it. "'Bring it in, Mr. Ashton, please,' he said wearily, turning around. "'I'm sorry I kept you so long. I was thinking of something else.' "'Always glad to have a rest, Mr. Gray,' answered the frame-maker, who was still gasping for breath. "'Where shall we put it, sir?' "'Oh, anywhere. Here, this will do. I don't want to have it hung up. Just lean it against the wall. Thanks.' "'Might one look at the work of art, sir?' Dorian started. "'It would not interest you, Mr. Ashton,' he said, keeping his eye on the old man. He felt ready to leap on him and fling him to the ground if he dared to lift the gorgeous hanging that concealed the secret of his life. "'I won't trouble you any more now. I am much obliged for your kindness in coming round.' "'Not at all, not at all, Mr. Gray. Ever ready to do anything for you, sir?' and Mr. Ashton trapped downstairs, followed by the assistant, who glanced back at Dorian with a look of shy wonder in his rough, uncomely face. He had never seen anyone so marvellous. When the sound of their footsteps had died away, Dorian locked the door and put the key in his pocket. He felt safe now. No one would ever look on the horrible thing. No eye but his would ever see his shame. On reaching the library, he found that it was after five o'clock, and that the tea had already been brought up. On a little table of dark, perfumed wood, thickly encrusted with nacre, a present from his guardian's wife, Lady Radley, who had spent the preceding winter in Cairo, was lying a note from Lord Henry, and beside it was a book bound in yellow paper, the cover slightly torn and the edges soiled, a copy of the third edition of St. James's Gazette had been placed on the tea-tray. It was evident that Victor had returned. 
He wondered if he had met the men in the hall as they were leaving the house, and had wormed out of them what they had been doing. He would be sure to miss the picture, had no doubt missed it already, while he had been laying the tea-things. The screen had not been replaced, and the blank space on the wall was visible. Perhaps some night he might find him creeping upstairs and trying to force the door of the room. It was a horrible thing to have a spy in one's house. He had heard of rich men who had been blackmailed all their lives by some servant who had read a letter, or overheard a conversation, or picked up a card with an address, or found beneath a pillow a withered flower or a bit of crumpled lace. He sighed, and, having poured himself out some tea, opened Lord Henry's note. It was simply to say that he sent him round the evening paper and a book that might interest him, and that he would be at the club at 8.15. He opened the St. James's languidly and looked through it. A red pencil mark on the fifth page caught his eye. He read the following paragraph. Inquest on an Actress An inquest was held this morning at the Bell Tavern, Hoxton Road, by Mr. Danby, the district coroner, on the body of Sybil Vane, a young actress recently engaged at the Royal Theatre, Holborn. A verdict of death by misadventure was returned. Considerable sympathy was expressed for the mother of the deceased, who was greatly affected during the giving of her own evidence, and that of Dr. Birrell, who had made the post-mortem examination of the deceased. He frowned slightly, and, tearing the paper in two, went across the room and flung the pieces into a gilt basket. How ugly it all was, and how horribly real ugliness made things! He felt a little annoyed with Lord Henry for having sent him the account, and it was certainly stupid of him to have marked it with red pencil. Victor might have read it. The man knew more than enough English for that. Perhaps he had read it, and had begun to suspect something. And, and yet, what did it matter? What had Dorian Gray to do with Sybil Vane's death? There was nothing to fear. Dorian Gray had not killed her. His eye fell on the yellow book that Lord Henry had sent him. What was it, he wondered. He went towards the little pearl-coloured octagonal stand, that had always looked to him like the work of some strange Egyptian bees who wrought in silver, and took the volume up. He flung himself into an armchair and began to turn over the leaves. After a few minutes he became absorbed. It was the strangest book he had ever read. It seemed to him that, in exquisite raiment, and to the delicate sound of flutes, the sins of the world were passing in dumb show before him. Things that he had dimly dreamed of were suddenly made real to him. Things of which he had never dreamed were gradually revealed. It was a novel without a plot, and with only one character, being, indeed, simply a psychological study of a certain young Parisian, who spent his life trying to realize in the nineteenth century all the passions and modes of thought that belonged to every century except his own, and to sum up, as it were, in himself, the various moods through which the world spirit had ever passed, loving, for their mere artificiality, those renunciations that men had unwisely called virtue, as much as those natural rebellions that wise men still call sin. The style in which it was written was that curious jeweled style, vivid and obscure at once, full of argot and archaisms, of technical expressions and of elaborate paraphrases that characterizes the work of some of the finest artists of the French school of decadence. There were in it metaphors as monstrous as orchids, and as evil in color. The life of the senses were described in the terms of mystical philosophy. One hardly knew at times whether one was reading the spiritual ecstasies of some medieval saint, or the morbid confessions of a modern sinner. It was a poisonous book. The heavy odor of incense seemed to cling about its pages, and to trouble the brain. The mere cadence of the senses, the subtle monotony of their music, so full as it was of complex refrains and movements elaborately repeated, produced in the mind of the lad, as he passed from chapter to chapter, a form of reverie, a malady of dreaming, 
that made him unconscious of the falling day and the creeping shadows. Cloudless, and pierced by one solitary star, a copper-green sky gleamed through the windows. He read on by its wan light till he could read no more. Then, after his valet had reminded him several times of the lateness of the hour, he got up, and going into the next room, placed the book on the little Florentine table that always stood at his bedside, and began to dress for dinner. It was almost nine o'clock before he reached the club, where he found Lord Henry sitting alone in the morning room, looking very bored. "'I am so sorry, Harry,' he cried, "'but really it is entirely your fault. "'That book you sent me so fascinated me "'I forgot what the time was.' "'I thought you would like it,' replied his host, "'rising from his chair. "'I didn't say I liked it, Harry. "'I said it fascinated me. "'There is a great difference. "'Ah, if you have discovered that, "'you have discovered a great deal.